This panel discussion that we're on and we're beginning right now, equity and good jobs in the clean economy, uh, state, state strategies for winning labor stands and equity is really important. And it's uh, something that's close to my heart with the work that we've been doing with Climate Jobs New York. Uh, we all know that in, in, in states and in localities and cities throughout the country, they are right where the center, in the center and in the middle of where all this work is being done on climate and making progress. And the panelists that we have today have led and continue to make progress on mitigating the effects of climate change and uh, doing everything that they can to make sure that we're creating good union jobs and, and combating inequality in the process. Uh, I want to briefly introduce some of the panelists before we get to them, and then we will be hearing from them. We are joined by terrific leaders, as I said. We're joined by Aziz Dekan. Aziz Dekan is the Executive Director on the Connecticut Roundtable on Climate and Jobs. Uh, Priscilla De La Cruz. Priscilla De La Cruz is the Senior Director of Government Affairs for the Audubon Society of Rhode Island and also the President of the Environmental Council and the Environment Council of Rhode Island and the Co-Chair of Climate Jobs Rhode Island. Pat Devaney is the Secretary Treasurer of the Illinois AFL-CIO. Pat is a member of the Executive Committee of Climate Jobs Illinois and Pat previously served <clears throat> as President of the Associated Firefighters of Illinois. Cynthia Finney. Cynthia is the president of the main AFL-CIO. Uh, she, she is the mem a member and former business manager of IBW Local 1837, where she represented 1,600 members employed primarily uh, at electric utilities and broadcast stations in Maine and in New Hampshire. Uh, Melissa Shetler. Melissa is the co-founder and former executive director of Pathways to Apprentice to Apprenticeship, a New York-based union pre-apprenticeship program that helps individuals from low-income communities with a focus on formerly incarcerated individuals entering into the building trades. Uh, they've been terrific leaders, and we know that they bring a wealth of knowledge and experience in combating climate, and we really look forward to hearing from them today. I know uh, my colleague Emma just went over the Slido instructions, and you will be hearing uh, we will repeat them during the day when we get to the question and answer portion of it. I just want to uh, go over them once again real quick for those who might have just joined recently. And I want to remind you that the Slido, uh, that will the, the program that we're going to be using Slido to ask the questions, uh, you scan the QR code on the, on the screen or type in the event number, which is 464-766 uh, on Slido.com. Once you're on the Slido page, you type your questions into the box at the top of the page at any time, and we'll try to make sure that we fit as many questions into the conversations as we can. Again, we're hoping to, uh, that you can identify yourself and your organization when you ask the question, but you could also ask anonymously, um, and you won't see other people's questions as well um, on the screen. So let us uh, begin at that particular point. I have a few questions the way we'll do this that I think we can have the, the most uh, productive dialogue as I'll ask some general questions and then we could just go around and, and I can, um, we can hear from each of you on, on the first few questions and then uh, we maybe we'll have a dialogue and, and some comments I know from some of you as well as follow-ups to these questions. But we talked about a lot of work being done at the state and local level. Uh, what are some of the victories that you all have had over the past year? Um, specifically, I would ask how has your state or your coalition that you belong to advanced equity and good jobs within the clean energy sector. So in, in no specific order, I'll go the same way that um, maybe I introduced you all. So we'll begin with Aziz. Aziz, good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you, everyone. Good to be on this panel. Um, I'm, I'm honored to be among all of you. Uh, we've all done some amazing work in our states. Um, I'll just give you a brief uh, update of what we've done in Connecticut. Uh, we passed a bill uh, by the number of SB 999, which, and I have to read it because it's a longer title than, than, than it should be. It's a just transition to climate protective energy production and community investment. And what that really means is that um, on renewable projects uh, greater than two megawatts, um, public and private projects, um, there will be workforce development, uh, 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 codification, there'll be um, equity training, there'll be uh, a community investment act involved with it, 
And we're hoping that there'll be labor standards that will, as we recognize, um, to have to create a level playing field. Uh, we've noticed that um, in the past that developers have often come in um, and bid on projects um, using out-of-state low-wage workers, and then they then they ref uh, I'm sorry they bid on it using uh, 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 project labor agreements. And then they bring in out-of-state workers. So they double up their profits. And that's just not right. It doesn't create any but any work that's that's sustainable in this state. And the state really Connecticut really needs jobs. So this bill helps create that, creates a level playing field. And we're we're working right now with the Department of Labor to make sure that the the codification in this bill are observed by by the developers um, within the bill itself. It covers um, uh, um, uh, operating and mechanical work, so that's a little different as well. Um, and we did it with with our partners. We have a, a coalition, a broad coalition of the trades, uh, environmental groups, um, some social justice and religious groups as well. And we found that you know using this coalition, we were able to to muscle up political power to get this bill passed. That's great, Aziz. And Priscilla, you want to talk a little bit about the work you're doing up in Rhode Island? Sure, happy to. Great to be here with you all today. I am um, here uh, to talk about the work that I've been doing with my partners and new friends at Climate Jobs Rhode Island. And I will say we are at, I, I would say, the start of our work and growing partnership and coalition building. But I'm really excited about what we have accomplished so far. And I am also eager to learn from you all. You are all doing incredible work. Um, so Climate Jobs Rhode Island um, came together in late 2020 when conversations really started among labor groups, um, Rhode Island AFL-CIO convening the conversation uh, among labor environmental groups in the state, which is my wheelhouse and the work that I've been doing over the years to address the climate crisis and with other environmental leaders in the state, as well as political um, leaders and really trying to figure out how can we work together and realizing we're not going to agree on everything, but there are opportunities and how do we really maximize those opportunities? And I will admit, um, we, we looked at Climate Jobs New York as a guide. Um, I, we thought you all built a great foundation and start to really Really looking at the work that was being done and where that work was working and how we could really tailor that to, to address the climate crisis in Rhode Island and as we work towards a green economy. So I will say um, briefly that our first victory, I think in coming together was developing really solid principles and goals. So formally launching in early 2021, and I'm really proud that we took time to really look at the language and to be intentional about the language. Um, and we spent a good amount of time talking about what does a just transition um, to a green economy mean to us as a coalition? Um, and really wanted to focus on making sure that it was a two part just transition that we're um, talking about frontline workers, but we're also talking about frontline communities and those communities that have been overburdened by pollution and disproportionately um, impacted by the impacts of pollution. So how do we really center those voices of frontline workers and communities as we work towards solution? And I think that really led to us presenting a unified front in being able to um, advocate with common unified language um, in saying we really need a solid framework to address the climate crisis. So we focused our efforts in advocating for the passage of the 2021 act on climate that set the framework for how our state is going to get to net net zero um, carbon emissions by 2050 and establishing interim targets. Um, so that successfully happened. Um, and within that piece of legislation, um, we called for the inclusion of these frontline voices coming from labor and frontline communities. Uh, so I, I will say that that has been our early victory, um, and now we're really focused on how we can build on that momentum. And I'm sure I'll have more to say about that as the conversation continues. Well, that's great. I'm, and I'm glad you, you mentioned focusing on the body of work that we all agree on when we combat, when we go about doing this work in climate, because at Climate Jobs New York, we 
always uh, felt that that's one of the guiding principles that we have to continue to uh, make sure that we're living by, and we have all done that. Uh, Pat, we'll, we'll move over to Pat Devaney, because, Pat, I know you, you have a, a lot of uh, a big victory that you could speak to, of course, but uh, let's hear from a little bit about the work that's going on up in Illinois. Good to see you. Hey, thanks, Vinny, and good morning, everyone. Um, so on behalf of the Illinois AFL-CIO and Climate Jobs Illinois, I really need to start off by thanking the Climate Jobs National Resource Center for, for all of their support over the last couple of years. Um, and I just, I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to provide this update. So last week in uh, Illinois was really a historic victory. On September 16th, our governor, J.B. Pritzker, signed a comprehensive energy bill that we believe is now the most pro-climate and pro-union law in the country. It was a culmination of 18 months of incredibly hard work and difficult negotiations, but we hope that the results will be used as a template for state policy that combats climate change and creates good union jobs in the development of clean energy generation sources. The new law invests $500 million each year in the development of renewables. Roughly half of the renewable energy credits or RECs are gonna be set aside for utility scale wind and solar and the remainder appropriated through an adjustable block program administered by the Illinois Power Agency. One of organized labor's primary focuses through the process was to set aside a significant portion of the RECs for our solar on schools program. We were really pleased to secure 15% of the RECs in the adjustable block program for solar installation on public schools and also um, to be able to do uh, energy efficiency audits in our public schools throughout the state, prioritizing our schools in the communities that um, are economically disadvantaged. The legislation also funds renewable energy credits for a coal to solar program that will create hundreds of good union jobs in the development of utility scale solar installation and battery storage at facilities that previously contain coal generation units. In regards to labor standards, we just had an incredible victory. All of the renewable development funded by RECs other than residential will be covered by prevailing wage. This means that any project greater than 25 kilowatts for residential and 100 kilowatts for houses of worship or churches that meet specific requirements in the tax code will pay its worker a prevailing wage and the corresponding benefits included in it. In addition, all utility, wind and solar projects will be subject to project labor agreements. In regards to equity, the new law also contains the most robust equity provisions of any state in the country. In it, we invest $180 million each year in programs aimed to diversify the workforce and green energy development. The programs include community-driven efforts as well as $10 million a year for climate job workforce hubs that will partner with the community organizations to recruit and prepare minorities for entry into our union apprenticeship programs for successful careers in the building and construction trades. The new law also includes programs for equity eligible contractors intended to provide opportunities for black and brown business owners to enter and grow into the new green energy space. They include rec set asides, business incubators, seed capital assistance, and administrative support that will break down barriers that have previously existed for minority contractors. We were also able to preserve our nuclear energy fleet by providing $700 million in carbon mitigation credits over five years to recognize them for their clean energy attributes. This is really important, both preserving thousands of jobs, as well as protecting the 50% of energy consumption used by Illinoisans, and also 90% of our clean energy generation. And lastly, and, but certainly not least, uh, the legislation creates an ambitious decarbonization schedule to make our electricity generation sector 100% carbon free by 2045. So while we understand that the decarbonization of fossil generation starting with coal is essential to meet our climate goals, it's also the source of hundreds of good paying union jobs in Illinois. We were able to include a set of just, just transition provisions in the new law that will provide a worker bill of rights to employees in retiring fossil generation. So it, it's a bit difficult summarizing a thousand page bill in just a few minutes here, but those are some of the top lines we were able to secure in the new law. Um, again, I can't overstate the importance of the role that the Climate Jobs National Resource Center played in reaching this result specifically, and on behalf of our state fed and Climate Jobs Illinois, I'd like to thank Mike Fishman, Dave Hancock, Larry Skinner, and Lee Smith for their guidance through this journey. And thanks again, letting us be a part of this discussion. Well, it's great work, Pat. You know, as a as a colleague in the AFL-CIO, we really uh, 
this is a terrific model that I know many of us are going to be looking at and seeing how we can replicate in states and locales throughout the country, which is really what we want to do. When you, when you stop and think about $180 million each year, even on the equity piece of this, which is such an important and critical part of the work, um, really terrific work. So congrats again. So another one of my colleagues, Cynthia, it is great to see you. I know you and, and Matt of Maine have been doing terrific work. Uh, we were proud uh, to, to work with you initially. It seems like it was just yesterday, but it was a long time ago when you set out doing this work. So let's uh, hear from some of the work that you've been doing over the past year, though. Sure, um, and we're excited that some of the work we've been doing earlier is starting to bear fruit, and it's really exciting to hear the details of what you uh, won through your efforts there, Pat, um, and others as well. So we've been working on this for directly and deliberately, I think, for three or four years now, as, as Vinny kind of referenced, and we began by um, – choosing some easy things to partner with environmental groups on to build and strengthen our relationship. We were reached out to by a, um, rep a legislator who wanted to pass a main version of the Green New Deal. Uh, that was a couple of years ago, but we've just gotten the rule that that bill uh, engendered, which eventually that rule, for reasons I won't go into, that, uh, that bill, a bunch of the other things went into other pieces, but that bill included really strong apprenticeship um, requirements for certain projects, and uh, it really kind of shook up things in the legislature when labor and the environmental groups came to testify on bills together on the same side of the bill. And that, that uh, rule came out. It's a really great bill, uh, rule. Uh, specifying about the apprenticeship requirements for things. Uh, we're really excited about it. We're also really excited that this comes at a time when we are starting to launch uh, what we hope is going to grow into some pre-apprenticeship work to reach out to communities that have not had access to these kinds of good union jobs uh, for all kinds of reasons, but one of which being that they didn't necessarily grow up with the skills that you would come to to just jump into an apprenticeship program. And so we're really, we were actually talking with another person who's on this panel about that just this, just this week and launching that program to reach out to our communities of um, new Mainers, immigrants from um, other places all over the world, but, you know, in particular, a lot of um, African immigrants in Maine, also uh, women who haven't had access to all the trains, uh, trades, but we have union apprenticeship programs also in our shipyard, also sometimes in our paper industry. So there are lots of opportunities there, and we anticipate as we do this work mm -hmm. on clean energy that there will be even more of them, and we want to be sure that we are transitioning not only to a sustainable climate situation, but a sustainable, equitable, and just economic situation. So we're excited to be working on both of those things. In Maine, in the past 25 years, we've probably succeeded in winning only two project labor agreements, but this year primarily led by our building trades or our building trades in co broad coalition with other organizations. We are really excited to have won two project labor agreements, one of which is um, related to an offshore wind project that uh, is being launched in the state, and the other of which has to do with, I have to look because they have a long list of how they describe this, Res climate resilient, energy efficient, affordable housing. Our building trades worked really closely with a broad coalition of environmentalists, housing activists, uh, the Maine People's Alliance, to pass this bill and get it with a project labor agreement. We're excited that the fruit of some of this work is that increasingly legislators are coming to us and or asking questions and considering labor impacts of bills that they're formulating. So this is also a huge step forward that will make work in the future easier. And we think that the winning of these project labor agreements is just one more sign that the time is right, right now for this work that we're doing. So I'll stop there so we can go on to others, but happy to go into more of the questions later. Great. Oh, no, I did want to do one more thing, which was that we were invited and really excited to work in coalition on a frontline climate project. Um, <clears throat> which consisted of members of several tribal organizations in Maine and the Maine People's Alliance, and which recognized workers as also frontline on climate, both in terms of the impact on members' jobs and the impact on, as we 
uh, ameliorate our systems to make them climate friendly that will happen to some jobs that exist now. We've been really pleased to be able to work in that coalition and that led to us endorsing the tribal sovereignty bill and to many other members, uh, also a transportation bill, and also to getting a really good coalition uh, testifying on a solar bill that we were working on uh, getting through the legislature. Well, thanks, Cynthia. I know you and Maine and the whole team up there have done great work, and we really look forward to continuing uh, to do work in the future. So, uh, Melissa, the first part of these, the title of this panel is Equity and Good Jobs. In a clean in the clean economy, which has been right like in the wheelhouse of the work that you've been doing over the years. So tell us a little bit about you know what you've done to address that and accomplished uh, more recently. Thank you so much, Vinny. Yeah, so so Pathways to Apprenticeship um, is a pre-apprenticeship program uh, that was developed here in New York City from a small group of volunteers originally within one local, has now expanded to a, a, all of the unions um, in the building trades in New York City, as well as Westchester. Uh, we've done a bunch of work now up there, which is great with some support of, of our leader um, in the Senate. And so we began by really partnering with communities around originally just rebuilding and just issues from both Sandy Build It Back and also in the affordable housing industry. Um, and the exciting thing is I think what we've done is laid some groundwork for the types of community labor partnerships and the types of trust and, and sort of evidence-based practices that are going to really reap benefits when all of this work gets um, launched in the climate world, right? So it's just going to be more slots and more success. Um, we work really closely with our community partners in, in every step of our process. We've also really educated the trades in, in how, um, while they've become open, uh, they're still complex, right? This is a whole industry and a language that is difficult for some community members to access. Um, in doing this work over the last 10 years, we've sort of grown from this little tiny um, volunteer project to getting 10 or 20 people a year into the job. So, um, you know, don't be afraid of a little pilot because it's grown into hundreds of people uh, into various trades. Um, and that's really, really exciting work for us uh, because we partner particularly with the formerly incarcerated uh, community we're really seeing um, the incredible transformation that a union job can have on not just an individual's life, but that individual's family's life and that entire community's life. Um, and our referrals are now folks that people are coming home and it's like, hey, I was locked up with this guy. You know, it, it's just this incredible network of people. They've gone on to become shop stewards and union leaders. They're testifying on behalf of good labor standards uh, for their communities and, and hopefully in green jobs soon. Um, this is really a space I think that we looked at as a place to grow activism and, and grow the work that we do in New York. Um, and Gary LaBarber has been really supportive from the New York City Building and Construction Trades, getting this work into the project labor agreements. So exciting here in New York City that the city PLAs have pre-apprenticeship language in them that, that directly identify pre-apprenticeship. Um, and we have created uh, an apprenticeship readiness collective. Uh, we're lucky in New York to have a history of pre-apprenticeship uh, that I certainly learned from when we were creating P2A, Pathways to Apprenticeship, uh, in construction skills, uh, which worked predominantly in the beginning with high school students, but then also expanded into communities uh, affected by Sandy, uh, so again, these same frontline communities, same marginalized communities that are seeing the effects of climate change. Um, and really targeting that work as well as non-traditional employment for women, right? So really increasing our, our numbers of women in the trades and then helmets to hard hats, right? Which works with veterans coming home who have skills maybe uh, that really tie well to the industry, but not necessarily the resume to get to get in. And so I am hopeful that all of this groundwork that we've managed to lay in the last 10 years um, is going to be a model. And I know the Apprenticeship Readiness Collective, as well as Pathways to Apprenticeship, is really excited to help advise and be part of a conversation uh, for folks looking to do the work, but also it's a place to point to say, hey, look, this does work, you know, because sometimes you'll get pushback. Oh, well, we're not going to be able to find any qualified workers in that neighborhood. Um, and we are the answer to that to say, no, that's not true. You just have to get in on the ground and do the training. Um, so that's that's sort of where we're at right now. Okay, so that that's great work. And I'll uh, 
I'll talk a little bit about, you know, we, we know that the problems associated with, with climate change, there aren't going away in some cases, you know, they're, they're increasing. So we have to do more and we have to do more faster as a group. So we talked about some of the accomplishments that we have, uh, that we've made over the past year. And I think that's terrific. And I think they're great models, as I said, for those of us working in state level coalitions, as we are in Climate Jobs New York, um, have done and want to continue to do. But a big question now is, well, where do we go from here? And I'll put this out to anybody uh, that, that you can you can jump in if you'd like. Um, but where do we go from here? Where do you coalition? You, you've developed uh, both institutionally, uh, some capacity that we can move work. You've accomplished things programmatically that are really great models for us and are going to and are going to do a lot of good at, at mitigating the effects of climate change, reversing some of these trends, at addressing the equity issues that are so important, particularly in a post-pandemic recovery. So where do we go from here? And what's next for your statewide uh, coalitions? And if you also want to address or respond to each other when you hear them from, I think that that would work out well, too, about some of the challenges that you face. And I know that's that's a lot, but I'll put it out there. Anybody wants to jump in right off the bat on that. You know, I can't help but want to jump in on, on and back in what Melissa and Cynthia just talked about. There's so much intersectionality that, that's uh, in our work. You know, the, the bill that we passed has a project labor agreement, but then what do you do with that? And how do you bring in people from marginalized communities? And how do you make sure that the projects that you do actually affect the people in those communities? How do you make sure that you know, for instance, uh, when Melissa was talking about the formerly incarcerated, how do you make sure that the previous models that we've had can be changed? And we've been we've been lucky in Connecticut to see like people like Joe Toner, who's the executive director of the, of the Connecticut Building Trades. He's deeply invested in bringing in people who have been incarcerated and and. That culture, I think, needs to be changed to make sure that no matter what bills we pass, no matter how hard we work, that we make sure that those people are are served and and that you know it's it's about housing, it's about transportation, it's about having um, as one of as Allison Pilcher, my policy director, often says, is to move away from poverty wages and to make sure that the jobs that that are created. Um, are, are sustainable, and also really to make sure that our trade partners and the general public understand that a, a just transition to renewables is just that, that it does create jobs and it does provide a pathway for people who normally wouldn't be getting into these positions. So I think that, you know, the work that we do, and, the, and, and, and I, I could keep going. Well, the other thing I wanted to say is, is transportation as well. So you could train all the people you want. Um, how do you make sure, as in Connecticut, for instance, how do you make sure they don't have to take five buses um, starting at three in the morning to get to their job sites? So these are all issues that we just continually, continually face. And, you know, because we're co broad coalitions, we're able to do that. And because of the voices here and the voices that are listening to us need to rise up and, and, and actually do stuff. It's a great, it's a great point, Aziz, because we, we always talk about that. You know, it's like we, uh, the, the equity side to this, it's, it's both, it's a two pronged approach that we've had from the beginning, right? Combating the, the dual crisis of inequality and climate change. And the thing about inequality and creating good jobs is also the people who have to um, making sure that we achieve a level of equity. I'm glad you mentioned transportation because that's something that's often overlooked. And there are a lot of transportation deserts that hit particularly uh, lower income communities, make oftentimes lower income communities, lower income communities of color. Um, I know myself from working in, in the night shift for many years in New York City, seeing people work that hard. There's, there's gotta be something that government and, and partners can do to address that, that issue. Uh, Priscilla, did you want to jump in? Yes, I would love to follow up on, yeah. on those great comments that are being made. I, I think for, for us in, in the Ocean State in, in Rhode Island, our challenge um, following up on our success of passing the 2021 Act on Climate is implementing it. So I love what has been mentioned in terms of we have to go beyond um, also passing policy. How do you actually get to implementation? And for us, um, with the 2021 Act on Climate, um, that for the first time 
in energy and environment legislation is saying the state government has to include labor voices. It has to include environmental justice voices. So how do we actually define um, what environmental justice communities are for, for our state and how do we really codify a just transition within state government to ensure that it both addresses um, the the inequity um, for frontline workers and frontline communities and really sustain that. Um, and, and for us as a coalition, I think that is also very true in two parts. So it's getting to implementing the act on climate, but also ensuring that as we are jointly advocating for the implementation of that bill, that we are also reflective of the communities that we serve and the communities that we want to work in partnership with. So how do we actually have more folks on the coalition um, that represent frontline workers and that represent communities of color and really continue and really build on um, a diverse coalition and a diverse movement. Um, and one of the things with implementing the Act on Climate, um, I see it as, you know, how do we leave no one behind as we're shifting to this transition and also creating new opportunities? So how do we work together to really overcome the barriers of people that look like me that didn't necessarily know that they had a career opportunity or a job in in the clean energy space and really figuring out what does that pathway look like. Um, and I think we're only going to be able to successfully do that in our state if we honor what our Act on Climate says. You need robust, robust engagement. You need to meet community members where they're at. You need to really, I, I love what Melissa, what you said in terms, you need to be on the ground. And one of the things I heard yesterday in another panel discussion that really stuck with me. Someone asked, you know, um, we often hear a conversation around, you know, how do I connect with communities of color? How do I form authentic partnership? And I, I love an answer that one of the panelists provided in, in that um, conversation yesterday and say, well, it's no different, right? You, you talk about building authentic partnerships and the approach of, you know, doing one-on-one, -on -one, being present, being visible, being there, being supportive, and really making sure that we're not engaging in extractive behavior. And that's the same thing, I think, in working in frontline communities, really making sure that um, you're present and that everything that we're creating in terms of a just transition towards a green economy um, is accessible um, and that folks see themselves in that. Um, and lastly, I'll, uh, I will um, add to that when thinking about implementing the Act on Climate, our coalition is very clear that we that involves 100% um, renewable electricity by 2030, really ensuring that we continue to be a leader in the development of offshore wind um, and that we do that in a way that um, we're addressing inequities and that's you know social inequities, racial inequities. Um, and really getting at that workforce development component. So Melissa, I will say here, I'm eager to, to work with you and continue that conversation as well as learning from what other states are doing on the ground in Connecticut, New York, Illinois. So this is very exciting for us as we envision that. And I think also with transportation, um, I love that point that was mentioned in terms of intersecting issues. Like we have to talk about housing, right? We have to talk about transportation and we have to really think about, you know, what are the things that folks on the front online are reacting to on a every single day when they're fighting um, for no more pollution expansion and how do we make sure that you know there is that dual approach how do we make sure that communities are not on that combative reactive when there are proposals to expand waste facilities in their backyard and, in, and instead the conversation is um, how we can transition to a clean energy economy and it can happen in your very backyard and that means a job for you as well. So and I and I will say lastly for me it, the past year has been a tremendous learning experience and working with labor and union groups um, and really making sure that from our end as a coalition that environmental groups are also um, really mindful of what it's going to take in hearing frontline workers to build strong um, quality jobs, union jobs with strong wages and making sure that communities of color, um, workers of color that are, are tapping into new opportunities are not going into low income paying jobs. Um, really, you know, how do we do this that in a way that really addresses um, and builds a stronger economy in Rhode Island? And, and sorry, that was long-winded. <laughs> no, 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 that, that, that's great. There's so many issues, and I know 
challenges and, and where we're going in the future. Pat, did you want to uh, jump in? I see you have Yeah, yeah Priscilla, yep. Priscilla's uh, comments around implementation is a perfect segue yep. into describing the next steps for our coalition. Um, while we certainly took a moment to celebrate when Governor Pritzker signed the bill last week, we knew that the real work li lies ahead and we're um, already meeting on a regular basis to talk about how best to implement all of these new provisions of this new massive statute. So the first thing we need to, to look at, and I heard someone describe the lack of labor standards, you know, previously in their state, we've certainly experienced that here in Illinois. Um, the last major energy bill they did in 2016 called the Future Energy Jobs Act was void of any labor standards. So what we've seen for the last five years is out of state developers coming in, you know, bidding on projects, bringing in, out-of-state workers, um, paying them very little, providing no benefits, and, and just you know taking all of the, the, the profits for themselves. With this new bill, with prevailing wage on literally everything except for residential and PLAs on all utility scale, we need to now make sure that the Illinois Power Agency has the tools and the equipment to be able to properly administer this and to provide the oversight that the people are following the rules. The other piece we need to look at in implementation, and it's completely aligned with, with what Priscilla described, is workforce development. We're, we're gonna be administering $500 million annually in RECs. Um, we're currently at 7% renewable generation. We're supposed to get to 40% uh, by 2030 and 50% by 2040. That's going to require a massive amount of renewable development and they are going to need the skilled employees that come with it. So we were really pleased, I described previously about the $10 million that we got to create our climate jobs union workforce development hubs. We need to invest and partner with existing community organizations and create new where they don't exist to make sure we are recruiting and preparing uh, a diverse set of, of workers to be able to work in this green energy space and to be enter our apprentice program so they not only are equipped to work on renewable de development but they're required they're going to have a career in the in the trades we have a great model as to how we're going to do this um, in terms of pre-apprenticeships um, the chicago federal La federation of labor and, and its affiliates a couple of years ago created a pre-apprenticeship program called hire 360 They've recruited um, over 700 um, people in the last two years, 80% of which are minorities, to prepare them for a, a job in the uh, apprenticeship program. We're going to copy that model and use it in other parts of the state to make sure we're doing the same in areas where those types of investments or those type of attentions haven't, haven't been uh, paid in the past. Um, the other thing we're going to do that we're really excited and it was the centerpiece of our, of our uh, bill was to promote our solar on school programs. We were lucky enough to be able to partner in our coalition with the IEA um, and the IFT, the Illinois Education Association and Illinois Federation of Teachers, where we're going to be going around and focusing and prioritizing another equity piece on schools and disadvantaged communities and environmental justice communities to place solar on those schools, to do those energy efficiency audits that are going to save school district money, provide cleaner classroom for both the students and the teachers. And we're really, really excited about promoting that throughout the state. So those are kind of some of the next steps that we're going to be taking to implement the parts of a bill that the governor signed last week. Glad to hear we're talking about implementation because so much gets lost sometimes in implementation. A law without proper funding and a plan for implementation becomes meaningless. It really does. Uh, Melissa or Cynthia, whoever wants to jump in, I'll uh, direct the question over to you. I'll, I'll pop in just for a second just to yep. say like in, in implementation too, it's um, I really like as you sort of mentioned this idea of no more poverty wages, right? And I think it's our job to really advocate and um, ensure that when there are government funds and when there are private funds coming uh, into the world of workforce development that we're not just repeating this cycle of poverty. I've seen this uh, over and over again. Um, and we really have to educate people about why sometimes it's quality over quantity. So maybe I can't train 500 people and place them, but I can train 200 or 150. And the ways in which their lives are going to change is going to affect 500 in a way that I, I'm sorry, but 
But in New York City, if you spent 20 years in jail because of something you did when you were 18 and you're coming back trying to rebuild your life on $15 an hour and invest in your future and the security of your family, good luck, right? And and we really need to push that conversation back. And and I also think in private foundation worlds too, right? It's it's a complicated world of philanthropy. Philanthropy looks a lot at workforce development. Let's make sure that people understand unions better and why this is really the place that we should be advocating for people to have a voice in the workplace and to be able to build that community power so that, you know, we're going to have, I think, you know, what Priscilla says, we're going to have advocates that actually are talking about their own communities and their own projects and their own lives as they get affected, as opposed to other folks talking for them. Um, And we really like this idea of credible messengers, you know, Um, the government likes to do its own recruitment, for example. People who are funding things say, oh, we're really good at doing the recruitment. And we've really found that actually people who have actually gone through our program are probably the best people to do the recruitment. And so we've had to really advocate for that idea, right? Like, okay, you can do some of it, but let's partner here because, you know, you haven't spent 20 years in the trades and we have the knowledge and it's a complex world. So let us translate for you, right? Let us us partner. And, you know, you're in charge of the government part. You're really good at that and we're good at this. So, you know, just kind of getting everyone's voice at that table more and more and working together to advocate for that. Great points. Uh, Cynthia, what about Maine? What what do you see in the future? Lots and lots of things. We're we're rocking and rolling, and uh, we've been hanging on by our fingertips as we've uh, added this work into what we already do and need to continue doing. Um, We're really excited that we're on the cusp of being able to launch our organization, as you did quite a while ago, Vinny, of our unions that want to work on this together and be able to have some staff who is dedicated to this work and that don't have to just fit it in at 3 in the morning for emails or 6 in the morning before the 8 o'clock meetings start and can fully devote their attention to it. That's going to make a huge difference for what we're able to accomplish, and a lot of that is thanks to our work with the um, Climate Jobs National Resource Center, who's been just fantastic in helping us set this up and um, make our visions more reality. Also, we want to be, uh, I was thinking as Aziz was talking, we've identified again with, with their help that transportation is Maine's largest contribution to the climate crisis. And our projects so far have mostly focused on solar because that's what the unions that started doing this were already engaged in and most interested in. As we expand, we really want to take, be able to take on and advance projects that touch more unions uh, in more ways. Transportation is certainly one of the areas that we'll be looking at. But also, we really want to bring this conversation more broadly and more deeply into the ranks of union membership know that IPCC report is terrifying. And who has time to think about that? Who has the resource to think about that? We owe it to our members. You know, I'm in the IBEW. I worked in an electric utility. These storms affect people who I know and love when they have to go work on them, you know? And sometimes working on a storm is a great little bump in your income, and sometimes it's pure awfulness. Um, And so, you know, this is the reality and we need to be able to be making places where people can have these conversations and connect the dots to what climate change means for their life, for their job, for our economy, and for the vision that we have of moving forward together with workers at the center. So we want to be expanding the quality and quantity of conversations that are happening at every level as we continue with this work. It really is such a, a pivotal time for this, and there's a lot of momentum for it as well. Uh, people are waking up to the need to act as a society on climate change, but also act as a society on, on inequality, too. And we heard about it pre-pandemic in New York City. We, we still down hundreds of thousands of jobs, and that's from people who were really hurting before, and we had this very expansive uh, income inequality in the city. So, you know, the, the notion that we're the, – the idea that we're going to – pursue both goals of addressing climate change, but making sure that we have an equity side uh, in the job creation as we transition to a clean energy economy is just so important. Um, I want to turn to Pat. Pat, you know, one of the, uh, you accomplished and and you all accomplished up in Illinois, a real terrific uh, model and legislative model that we can, that, that we could all look at and aspire to in the future. Uh, I'm sure that there were 
some obstacles to, achieve, uh, to achieving some of the labor standards for clean energy work that you, that you might have experienced up there. I want to see if maybe you want to talk a little bit about them and how you overcame them as a coalition. Yeah, yeah, sure, Vinny. So as everyone might expect, you know, the labor standards were definitely a, a primary focus in our efforts. Our philosophy was, and we spoke about it often to stakeholders, was that labor sat down at a table led by the Climate Jobs National Resource Center, had a hard discussion about climate change for all of the reasons Cynthia so ably just described. And we made a decision that we were going to be a part of transitioning away from fossil generation to clean energy generation in the future. That's difficult for us because along with that come the hundreds and thousands of good paying jobs that are in coal facilities that are in natural gas construction. And so to be able to do that, we wanted to create good paying union jobs in the new renewable energy space. It was difficult. Um, the initial opposition is what you might expect. Renewable energy developers, you know, wanted to keep labor costs as low as possible to, to you know, to, to add to their bottom line. We were able to, to overcome the, that obstacle. The one piece that we didn't anticipate, but it became a primary focus of the discussion was there was a notion um, put forward by some of the minority contractors that requiring to pay a prevailing wage would be a barrier for black and brown contractors entering the renewable energy development space or growing their business within it. And there were efforts to exempt um, equity eligible contractors. The, the challenge really turned into a strength because it required us to have good discussions about equity with the contractors, not only in workforce development, but on the business side of it. And what we were able to do, we were able to negotiate and, and, and put provisions in the bill that provided seed capital assistance for equity eligible contractors, administrative support, teaching them you know, about doing certified payroll and pricing the RECs appropriately to be able to offset that the amount that they would have to pay what they're paying currently versus a prevailing wage. And I think in the end, paying all workers and particularly minority workers, a prevailing wage and the benefits that are going to go along with it are not only going to, to help in terms of renewable energy development, but it's going to help all of these workers, you know, enter or ascend within the middle class. So we're really proud of the, the end result, but you're right. There were challenges along the way that we had to overcome. And that's just a couple of them that we faced. Yeah. And I'm sure that others have faced challenges too. You can feel free to just jump in and, and, um, and talk about that when, when with respect to winning the labor standards and, and some of the challenges that that you face so uh, anyone else want to add to that at all i'll just quickly add from from our standpoint i i've mentioned um in other settings how progressive the language in the act on climate bill was in terms of injecting in in state law um, labor and environmental justice. And that bill was a very heavy lift that really required all hands on deck and a unified voice, especially after um, seven years of our legislature and state government not addressing the climate crisis and not passing a single bill on energy and, in, and climate. And I really appreciate Cynthia's comment in terms of reminding us of how overwhelming the science is when we think about the climate crisis and how it's only going to get worse, right? But we have an opportunity in trying to reverse those impacts um, and thinking about how do we create strong climate jobs and how do we ensure that no one's left behind in that. So thinking about for us, as we have a growing offshore wind industry, as we look to responsibly develop onshore renewables, including solar, um, and also um, in continue to invest in energy efficiency, um, how do we do that with injecting strong labor standards and, and do that jointly together as an environmental um, community and also um, in partnership with labor? And I think that will hopefully um, going into our next legislative session really give us um, the weight that we need um, as we collectively amplify that message that we need to invest in climate and we need to invest in climate jobs. Um, and also thinking about um, the opportunity with addressing the current impacts of climate, um, especially for us in the ocean state with nearly 
400 miles of coastal line, we, we have to think about how do we adapt to climate change. And there is also economic opportunity in investing in green infrastructure. And where we're thinking about the Amer- uh, American jobs plan and the federal dollars that we'll be allocating, you know, how do we maximize those opportunities together as Climate Jobs Rhode Island and really advocate for those types of projects that are going to create strong, strong wages um, as we create new opportunities for new folks. Yeah. And, you know, when we um, when we fight for those labor stands, I know we always like to uh, say that, like, to the extent that we can legislate some of these things into law, it's great. But we also always have to remind people that we have to fight to have to have workers have a voice at work in their workplace to, through collective bargaining. Why? Because we talked about implementation and we talked about enforcements. And when you negotiate a contract, as all of us know in the labor movement, you have you have a mechanism in place to enforce that contract, to pay to make sure that people are, um, you know, that, are, that, that they're playing by the rules, you know, that there is an enforcement mechanism that comes along with collective bargaining along with the voice at work that is really important as well. Um, Cynthia, what are, you, what are you all doing? I mean, so much of, what it, of, of this work that we're doing also has to, uh, should involve educating um, and mobilizing our workforce, right? Or rank and file, also uh, members and getting them involved in this conversation on climate change. Uh, I know you all have uh, have discussed this up in Maine, and it's something that is is a desire of you all, not to just go and do this work, but make sure that we are, we're organizing workers, we're organizing our rank and file, we're talking about them, and we're, and we're making sure that they're involved as well. So uh, you wanna talk a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, One of the first things we did as we expanded the conversation um, was our convention is a place that really has typically a good mix of union leadership and rank and file in terms of who comes to it as delegates. And we invited Vinny and uh, Mike Fishman to come and talk about the work that had been in in New York, putting together a coalition of the willing to uh, start moving on this and talk about how they did that to spur a conversation broadly in our um, uh, in our state amongst union members and leadership. And so that was a good jump start and got us off on a, on a good foot of including lots of people. But, you know, frankly, we're kind of on a cusp of really trying to think about what are some of the next steps to keep the conversation bigger than the 35 or 40 union mostly leaders um, who get together in the room that have been working to form this organization so that we can have you know staff up and and get going so i'd also be really eager to hear what others have to say about how you involve your general membership and in the conversation and the decisions uh, because it's really it's really important and so that's that's one of the things we've done but we also regularly put you know, things about it in our newsletter so folks know what's going on. Our email newsletter is pretty widely read, um, never as widely read as we want it to be, but pretty widely read. And we make sure that this is a recurring feature when things happen, when a union accomplishes something or when our coalition takes another step or things like that, that that, that news is in there for people to be seeing and responding to as well as on our social media. So those are a couple of the things we've done, but we really need to take bigger steps there. Yeah, it's really important. I know we've tried to do this uh, within Climate Jobs New York. I think to some with some success, uh, we just, you know, particularly in the offshore wind campaign and making sure that we, um, we're educating and we're involving our, our members. And it's a real uh, rank and file kind of movement to go out and pursue this work opportunity and make sure that there are labor stands attached to it and why it's important. They're great advocates for this within the community. Uh, so it is important. Anybody else want to comment on that before we go uh, uh, to the Q&A portion? Priscilla? I'll just quickly add just a different perspective coming from, from myself and also um, from what I think is unique to us in Rhode Island that from the start having environmental and labor groups there. I, one of our, our principles that um, we are also very mindful of is how do we continue the shared learning and building um, the partnership that we currently have and just wanted to mention some quick examples about that. So for example, the co-chair um, of Climate Jobs Rhode Island, um, Patrick Crawley, um, who is with Rhode Island AFL-CIO, was newly appointed to the advisory board of the Rhode Island Executive Climate Change Council, and that's one of the bodies tasked with um, 
implementing the act on climate and really working with the full body of, of that coordinating council to implement the act on climate. So that, I, I think that's a significant um, step in terms of making sure that labor um, is at the table when talking about um, a green energy transition and implementing that climate bill. Um, and then also um, another um, example, small, but I think also sign- uh, might be small to some, but significant where I will be speaking um, at the Rhode Island AFL-CIO convention and talking about the importance um, of, of transitioning to a green economy and how critical labor is to that and how critical frontline workers are as we work to implement the act on climate. So we're, we're really thinking about ways that we can strengthen our partnership and that unified voice while also working in dual tracks of um, expanding our coalition and really building a diverse coalition that centers equity as well. That is great. Melissa? Yeah, and I just my background is, um, you know, popular education in this world of education that way. And so I've done a lot of organizer trainings over time. I worked with the Iron Workers Union and the Laborers Union. And, you know, I think really getting in the same way we organize uh, organizing trainings, getting in there and doing climate activism trainings um, and really putting the power in the hands of our members to do that work. Um, so, you know, I, I have my, my, my large vision dream is that we invest in like a federal theater project model where people are going around doing member to member education with some sort of creative uh, messaging. But but those are kind of big picture ways too that you know labor can really invest in creating those spaces and and doing that in conjunction with environmental groups, right? So that people are getting educated from folks who've been on the ground again in that same space to learn from, um, I think could be really exciting work. And I want to add something about education too. I mean, we're talking about uh, educating but part of the challenge that we faced in Connecticut was that we had small solar companies, rooftop solar people Mm -hmm. coming after us on this bill. And um, we were really surprised by that because it was very clear that our bill was two megawatts or greater and it did not affect them. But I think what happened was what they were concerned about was, and I I swear I'll never quote him again, but Ronald Reagan's theory of trickle down. I think they were afraid that trickle down in the opposite way where good wages would trickle down onto their workers. That's what they were afraid of. So education is a big part of how you educate the larger Um, uh, green industry, you know, the small contractors, Pat talked about, you know, uh, uh, people of color and and how they were concerned about how it would affect their work. And so we need to do a bigger education of that. And how we challenged them was by just countering what they talked about. And, you know, they did op-ed pieces and we countered their op-ed. And, you know, we're in an age of disinformation. And so we just have to continue to talk about this And what I found, and some of the politicians too, actually, I mean, I had one politician during the debate on the bill who said, well, I don't like, uh, I don't like to use the word just in any bill. And I'm thinking, well, wait a minute, justice and justice for all is in the Pledge of Allegiance. Are you against that? Should we eliminate that? How come justice all of a sudden not good when you see it in a bill that you're, that you don't believe in? So there's, there's this educational piece that we need to do and we have to keep fighting on it. You know, uh, we're all, I think, at heart organizers and in the way to organize as I see it is literally block by block and to make sure that when you have your voice that you just you your voice is important but your ears are equally important and you have to listen to what people are saying to you you can't parachute yourself into a situation and you have to make sure that what you say is is what you're going to do and I think that's a big part of what we're doing about education Um, you know, one last piece. Just recently, we were, we were invited to talk to uh, mid-sized solar people, mid-sized, in, in particular, solar people who wanted to, to work with us and find ways to coalition with us. And the first thing we asked them was, would you, would you apply PLAs to your work? And without hesitation, they said yes. So we're making inroads that way, and that's part of the educational piece. Great points. Uh, anybody else want to add, add, Pat, anything on the educating members? I know you all have done a great job as well up there, and this is an important part of your work as well. I think they've covered it well, Benny. I think you're going yeah. on the questions. It's so important. It really is. Um, and I'm glad to hear that everybody sees this as part of the core of, of, of how they go about and the, the work that they're doing. 
So why don't we do this? Let's bring uh, Dave Hancock, who I know who many of you have worked with. We'll bring Dave in and we'll uh, do some Q&A from folks. It's been a great discussion thus far. Dave, I will just repeat to the uh, to our audience uh, some of the uh, on how they can go about some of the instructions on how they can be, go about asking uh, questions. I want to remind everybody we're using a Slido and you could scan the QR code on your screen or type in our event number 464766 on your Slido.com. Uh, once you're on the Slido page, type your question into the box at the top of the page at any time and we will try to fit it into the conversation. Uh, we're hoping you could also identify yourself and your organization as well. So I will kick it over to Dave at this time. Thanks, Vinny. And hi, everybody. We have a ton of questions that folks have submitted, um, and I think we're going to be able to get through some really great ones. And we've got a little bit, like 20, 25 minutes left for discussion, so I think we'll be able to hit a couple of good questions and a couple of really tough questions. Um, so the first question that I want to um, – uh, bring out to everybody um, is from John Murphy with the UA in New York. And, you know, it, it hits on this concept of a just transition that we've all talked about in our work. And I think folks are really drilling in to try to, to figure out what that means in each state that we're working in. And John's question is what is the just transition for fossil fuel workers to renewables and how are you including clean energy, not just renewable energy like solar and wind, but clean energy in this equation and in this sort of just transition? And um, I think let's start with Pat, just because you folks got a, a little specific on just transition in the bill that was signed last week, but then let's open it to everybody else who's dealing with this in each different state context. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and so, you know, there were several different ways we dealt with it. And, and clean energy generation is really pivotal um, to that discussion, particularly in Illinois around our nuclear fleet. So we were able to include just transition provisions um, that, that included a worker's bill of right that provides training opportunities, scholarship opportunities, um, um, other types of protections for employees that are transitioning out of fossil generation into other types of employment, including renewable development. One of the other things that we were able to do um, in regards to decarbonization, um, which, which is pretty complicated, the decarbonization schedule they created in Illinois, but one of the things that we adhered to was, yes, we agree that we need to eliminate carbon um, to combat climate change. However, we need to do it in a rational and reasonable way. We need to do it where we're not shutting down Illinois fossil generation and then bringing in or importing out of state fossil generation that in many cases was even dirtier than what existed in our state. And then, and then thirdly, you know, the nuclear piece for us, we have thousands of, of members that work in these six nuclear facilities. Um, currently, nuclear generation is, is somewhat uneconomical compared to other types of generation, particularly, you know, the inexpensive natural gas. And so being able to reward them for their clean energy generation attributes was really, really critical for us to protect those thousands of direct jobs, but also the indirect jobs, many of them done by the members of the UA when they come in and do the turnarounds um, in these facilities and all the maintenance and refueling um, exercises. So there were several different ways we did address um, uh, just transition in the bill. However, I'll be frank and candid, that's an area where we need to do more work. Um, you know, some of the proposals that we made around just transition, including health insurance coverage, as well as um, property tax replacement and some of these uh, cities and regions that are going to be devastated by these plant retirements ended up on, on the cutting room floor. So I, I think, think we need to go back to that and fill out some of those gaps that, you know, these workers that are going to be transitioned, unwillingly transitioned out of employment, fossil generation are taken better care of in the future. Anybody else want to address the just transition question from John Murphy? Yeah, I'm happy to um, quickly jump in on that. So so for us in terms uh, as a coalition, Climate Jobs Rhode Island, defining our, our just transition, um, I will go ahead and just read the sentence because I think it really embodies what we're trying to achieve here. Um, so we do talk about a just transition to a net zero emission economy. Um, and, and of course, it includes centering racial and social justice. Um, and as I mentioned earlier in our discussion, it includes specifically amenities frontline workers as well as frontline communities. Um, and in our definition, we talk about um, the sentences, a just transition must contain strong labor standards, including protections for families 
supporting and sustaining wages and benefits, procurement transparency, and strong industry training standards. So there's a lot there. Um, we do expand in our goals and explicitly mention energy efficiency, um, considering that also part of that clean energy transition. In Rhode Island, um, we have strong energy efficiency programs, um, often rated uh, among the top um, four in, in the nation. And I think for us as a coalition, it becomes how do we protect those programs, but also how do we enhance and expand those energy efficiency programs as we're working to decarbonize um, um, you know, those points that Pat stressed. It's, it's also about how do we um, reduce uh, our fossil fuel based um, consumption and based economy? Um, and how do we ensure that we're seeing the transition across all sectors, right? And that, go and that also includes public and private buildings and so on. So we're really talking about a comprehensive approach. And I will say from our end, um, we're super excited to be working um, with, with Cornell University on, on developing a plan that's going to help expand on our principles and visions and really lay out that framework um, for how we plan to go about that just transition and really create those strong clean energy jobs and ensure that there is that transition for existing workers as well. Before we move on, we've got a lot of great questions. Anybody else want to respond to the just transition question? Yeah, I was just going to say that we uh, participated with the Labor Network for Sustainability in their listening project on just transition. And it's going to read, this is part of what's important about having these conversations uh, at all levels and deeply into our organizations is hearing what workers need. And I think we need to always keep in focus that we're trying to build any, we're not trying to do some little thing in the economy. We're actually trying to build an economy that actually works for and supports everyone. I used to work in the shoe industry. I used to hand sew shoes. How many shoes are made in this country anymore? Those jobs went away. There wasn't a just transition for most of us because the TAA is inadequate. So we have models of what's been inadequate. We have to think bigger and push bigger for an economy where that is the primary goal. Great. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, I'd like to move on to another question. This comes from actually two, a two part question from Kelly, a rank and file member of the IUOE. Um, what are real solutions to raise the number of women and BIPOC out in the field? And then an important follow up question. How can we hold unions and contractors accountable to retaining women and BIPOC workers um, that have been recruited? So, um, um, you know, everyone should respond, but um, I want to ask Melissa if you can take a first stab at this. And thank you, Kelly, for sending those questions. Yeah, um, and it's a great question. Um, I think it's something that uh, all of us are always trying to get better at um, and learn from. And so, you know, one thing is getting leadership on board um, to really understand why these quality jobs need to 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 be expanded to, to all communities um, and in the places where that exists to really, you know, hold up the, the communities that are succeeding and say, look, this is why you need to, to, to look at your model. I think when you live inside of a box, sometimes you forget um, that that box is kind of complex, right? And so understanding that it, it, it might be your language, but it's not everyone's language, being open to being able to share those ideas. I think that there are some great models like non-traditional employment for women, um, obviously pathways to apprenticeship and our partnerships we've done with, with the formerly incarcerated and actually even with the incarcerated, we've gone in and done education at, at Rikers. We've had people get into the unions while they were still away and come out and directly in and, you know, that's some exciting work. But I think that even in doing that, I think that there's a, a part of that question that also asks this question of how do people stay, um, right? And so we need mentorship and we need commitment to, to protecting folks um, once they get out in the field and to understand, again, that it's a little different. You know, I was thinking a lot about the, the solar offshore wind industry and, you know, there's there's a complex question in terms of how you do that work. Do you have to go live on a ship for an X number of months or weeks or whatever it is? What if you have children at home? What if you have different things? How do you provide childcare? So these are complex questions. Uh, the solar industry in New York, a lot of the farms that are coming up, I think are going to be really rural. Um, and a lot of the communities that we're working with are urban. You know, how are we transporting them? So this great question of transportation uh, in an efficient way, um, 
and investing in that and making sure that people have that little extra something they need to succeed. Um, and so the last thing I would say is it's just, you know, again, when we grow up in an environment, we might take it for granted. If, if you had an uncle or a brother or wh whoever was in the trades, you kind of knew the culture right away, right? And so when we talk about recruiting women and, and, and BIPOC people, we need to remember that they didn't grow up in that culture. And so, you know, that second chance that you gave so-and-so's son, you, you want to give that second chance as well and not sort of create um, unequal, unequal repercussions for actions. So sort of thinking about how do we really, really take that extra step to make sure that people can succeed and that they can stay and they can build their, their careers. Thanks, Melissa. Would anybody like to jump in and comment on that question? Yeah, I think from the labor's perspective, um, I, I think the legislation uh, that just became law in Illinois is going to be proven as a template for how best to to address equity and particularly recruiting and retaining, you know, uh, women and people of color in, into the trades and particularly in the renewable energy space. We're investing massive amounts of money in terms of recruiting people and not just, you know, identifying people, but actually preparing them so they're successful in the apprenticeship programs. And how are we, how are we doing this? We're looking to what has worked. We're looking at models that have actually been successful in recruiting and preparing people for um, our apprenticeship programs. We're also not just going to like create aspirational goals. We actually carve out renewable energy credits, 30% of the adjustable block program for people who meet the definition of equity eligible contractors. We're providing contractors, contractors of color um, who are more inclined to hire workers of color and actually putting dollars you know, available to them to be able to enter the renewable energy space as well as, as grow within it. And then on the enforcement side of it, there is a robust um, requirements in regards to renewable energy credits, ongoing reporting to the Illinois Power Agency, as well as expanding the Bureau of Apprenticeships um, uh, oversight in, in Illinois to be able to look and see what's happening in the energy space. So they're not just going to take our word that we're do, going to do better and they're doing better. They're actually going to look and verify it down the road. So I think we took a multi-pronged approach and I, I'm hopeful and, and I feel somewhat confident that in five years from now, we're going to have a different conversation about what's been done in terms of recruiting people, um, minorities um, into the renewable energy space in our apprenticeship programs. And in, in Connecticut, we have so many different uh, workforce development entities and the push now as as we see it from the round table is to start bringing those those together and and watching where i like what melissa said and where she was going about breaking down barriers um you know if if i hadn't if 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 i was in a culture that i had no understanding of how do i fit into that culture and how do i um as as a as a, a middle eastern man how do i fit into a, a white man's world. So it, it's not easy at all. And, you know, the the norms that we have need to be broken down. And the way we see it in Connecticut, I think, and, and the roundtable is looking at it, is to work with trades to make sure that while they're doing workforce development, that they put a strong equity piece into it. And as the roundtable itself, we're just trying to figure out what equity really means. What What is the definition of that? And how does it, what's the equal, equal What's equity and just transition and where are those, where does that fit? And we're just beginning to learn that and try and, and doing training within our organization and hopefully outside the organization as well. And I'll just quickly add, I think for us in Rhode Island, um, in, in learning from our members of the, of the Climate Jobs um, Coalition and uh, friends in, in, in labor that there are really successful apprenticeship programs here that are being led by folks in, in union in union and with union and labor groups. So I think for me, from my personal perspective, is like how do we tap into what's working um, that's successful and expand that and really ensuring uh, I love what has been said in terms of being visible, being in the community and ensuring that um, 
communities of color know that they are part of this transition and that they can tap into these jobs. And this is how, um, and I love that point that Melissa mentioned about retention, because we often think about recruitment, um, but also thinking about once um, there is a more diverse workforce, how do, workforce, how do you actually retain the folks of color, color and really help them um, overcome the barriers? Because I think there's barriers to recruitment and there's also barriers to retention. And really, we're going to do that um, by listening. I, uh, as you mentioned that earlier, like we really have to be present in these communities um, and for forming authentic partnerships um, and really listening also to community members. And I think from, from our end in, in Rhode Island, there are also folks that are on the ground trying to address some of these barriers, right? When we think about housing and um, and transportation and so on. So how do we work together to really help um, overcome those barriers as we're thinking about creating more opportunities and expanding those opportunities? Great, thank you. Cynthia, did you wanna jump in on this question before we moved on to the next? I think it's all been said. Um, the amazing thing about this panel, FYI, is folks respond to a question, and then in their response, they end up responding to multiple follow-up questions that are also on this uh, Slido page. So thank you for making my life much easier. Um, here's a big question that was inspired by an earlier panel on the American Jobs Plan and what's at stake and the sort of opportunity to invest additional crucial federal money in good jobs and clean energy. If the federal American jobs plan money will have to be spent by the states and the cities in the next five years, is there time to scale up the coalitions that folks are talking about and the apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship programs that folks are talking about to catch up with these funds? So really, how can we be responding and anticipating and building in the states um, to leverage this federal investment? And Pat, you've talked about implementation, you have Aziz also, you know, how are we implementing big federal pots of money and federal programs? And so I'll open that up to everybody. I can give my very short response to that. My initial reaction is we have no choice. We have to figure it out. <laughs> uh, you know, there's, there's urgency in the climate crisis and there's urgency in ensuring that, you know, as advocates, as a coalition, we can advocate for all of the above, right? We, we have to make sure that these investments are done well and that they're done through a climate and an equity lens. Um, so I think that's where we, we really have to stress the all hands on deck and that only I think that not only applies to the respective coalitions I work with, but it's also um, leaning in to other partnerships and also working with with communities like we, we have been echoing throughout the panel. We we have to figure it out the time. It's a quick turnaround, but I'm optimistic that we can do it because the urgency and the momentum is there. Part of my concern is, I agree with what Priscilla said. I mean, for, for me, my, my work habit is if I have a short period of time to do something, I'm going to work even harder to do it. So there's that. But, but part of it, too, is to identify where those pots are and who controls that money. And um, if, if we don't recognize that, by the time we do, it may be gone. So, you know, it's a, it's a large amount of money. People want want their hands on it, rightfully so. But we need to we need to make sure that the work that we're doing, um, the money comes to us as well. And and again, I want to know want to know who controls that. Uh, it's been, it's a big part of it. But uh, there's no time to waste um, at all, as I see it. Yeah, I agree with everyone. I think I think making the investments now. I mean, frankly, they should have been you know been made in the past. But I, I guess we can just control what we begin to do now. So making these investments now, like we're doing around workforce development, using the models that that have worked and worked, um, like Priscilla described, including that that higher three hundred and sixty pre apprenticeship program that literally has hundreds of a, a diverse um, workers that are ready to enter the apprenticeship programs and get in the pipeline to be able to work in this space. So we've created policy in the state that prepares us to do it. And I guess just, you know, encouraging that and helping out uh, using it as a template in other states. So we're prepared if additional federal resources come in would be, be the response. Great. Anybody else before I move on? Um, so we have one 
follow-up question, Oren from Labor Network for Sustainability. This is specifically for Illinois, but I think it also relates to all the work everyone's been doing, pushing high road union labor standards and clean energy and renewable energy space. So how are you able to overcome the obstacles of clean energy developers who wanted to keep costs low? And how did you know, what kind of mechanisms did you put into law specifically to try to address, you know, labor costs and, and high road labor standards? So Oren asked this specifically of Pat, but I'm going to then turn to Cynthia and Aziz to also talk about this in their states because um, they made big strides in the last legislative session as well. So, I mean, it, it helps that Illinois, you know, is a, is a progressive pro-labor state um, for having the conversation about what labor standards would apply to, you know, this, this emerging sector that's going to, to grow enormously in our state and be funded by ratepayers. And so, again, we adhered to that principle. Here's what you're asking labor to, labor to do in transitioning out of fossil into renewable energy, clean energy generation in the future. And frankly, we were able to convince policymakers that that was the right policy for our state. It made sense for working people. It made sense for our state's economy. And, and you know, initially reluctantly, and then more and more so, I think looking at a bigger picture, being able, you know, to talk with the Illinois Power Agency who's going to administer the renewable energy credits about pricing the RECs appropriately um, to take into consideration paying a prevailing wage where almost all of the work had been done previously without it. All of those conversations helped to get us to a place where there was an agreement at the end. There was an agreement from the Path to 100 that represented the renewable energy industry, the Clean Jobs Coalition that represented the environmental interests, and then Climate Jobs Illinois that, that represented organized labor. So. Getting there wasn't that simple, but in the end, I think it was a result that, that everybody, you know, embraced it and we're going to move forward to, together. I, I think, again, it was a challenge at first, but it turned into a strength. A couple of things that we've done are, I mentioned earlier, we've required strong apprenticeship standards and also unrelated to this work, uh, but completely related to it, you know, in the last administration in Washington, we fought along with many of our other union brothers and sisters to keep the, uh, the definition of one of the apprentices is meaningful because there was an effort to make it unmeaningful. And I think that fight is constant and ongoing about any labor standards about keeping them actually meaningful so that they're actually things that actually benefit the workers doing the work. Another thing that's emerging that I think will have an impact on this, that the pan the pandemic has caused many workers who have previously, for whatever reasons, felt that they needed to put up with substandard conditions to decide that they're no longer willing to do so. And that is really going to um, shift some of what needs to happen in order to um, make the kinds of jobs that people want to have in order to go forward. So that's a piece here that we hadn't counted on, hadn't foreseen, that's all of a sudden making itself part of the equation that I think is really interesting. And in Connecticut, one of the thing, one of the the genesis of of our bill and the work that we're doing, is that we saw a developer a developer uh, putting one of the largest solar arrays together, using you know, uh, uh, intending to use out of state low low wage workers, and we felt that if we had to go after each project that way, um, we would be wasting our time. I mean, we would, we, we, all we would be doing is chasing. And instead of chasing, we decided to get in front of it and try to, and, and, and codify. It, it's kind of fascinating because concurrent to, to this panel, uh, my staff is on a call with the Connecticut DEEP talking about labor provisions that, that are attached to this bill. So, you know, the, the, the struggle continues that way. Um, one of the things that we ended up doing and, and how we, we're trying to put the fear into developers who seem to be fearless was to, to, to file FOIAs against them <clears throat> to see exactly what was in their contracts <clears throat> that they were redacting <clears throat> because it didn't make any sense to us. What are you redacting in these things? So you, I, the path forward is always that, is, is to uh, jump over those hurdles and to make sure that when you're challenged, or, or, or the way I see it is, before you challenge, challenge them and make sure that that you know whatever you do um, is is righteous as righteous as you could possibly make it and bring your people with you on this and bring a broad coalition with you great thanks 
anyone else want to respond in this question? You know, and I guess Vinny from New York, who also won pretty groundbreaking labor standards in advance of these other states, you know, what was the experience of, of New York in trying to overcome some of this opposition and how, how were folks able to do it? Well, what we, um, you know, the, the New York story, I think, is, is one where we've had, uh, we, we want to make sure we've always really done, uh, come, come together, make sure that we're pursuing, um, continue to pursue the standards uh, and, and any legislation. It, it's twofold, but we pursue standards and legislation where you need in order to make sure that we're, we're, we're securing work opportunities where we have to, but then uh, making sure also that we're just, opening up uh, uh, doorways and uh, to people who maybe haven't had opportunities in the past, make sure that they have access to these jobs and, and make sure that there's proper implementation on in this work and, um, and just keep moving forward. We know that there's going to be a tremendous amount of work in the future, in the future, you know? Right. And I know that we've got about two yep. minutes left on the panel. So I'm going to hand it back to you, Vinny. Sure. Well, I I would say, uh, is there any last minute thoughts or, or comments? Otherwise, I'll I'll just kind of close us out. Anybody? You, you all, I got to tell you, we talk about state strategies for winning standards and equity. You are shining examples of that. You really are. Uh, we've accomplished a lot, but I like that second question. What are we doing in the future? Because we can't just rest on our laurels. We have to move forward. People ask me often, well what is it that you all are doing with this work? I said, really, it, we're, we're just building up uh, organizational capacity to do climate work in all locales, um, certainly in all of your states and in our state here in New York. We're pursuing work opportunities for all working people in the clean energy sector as it's built out in this country and expands. And we're making sure that we secure labor standards uh, in that work. And I think if we, um, I really believe that if we do that, we are going to make significant, significant process in the way and in, in the manner in which we accomplish the goals, which we've all set out and we've heard over and over of addressing climate change, uh, making sure we have an impact, we address climate change and reverse inequality through the creation of good union jobs and el eliminating those longstanding racial inequities which have existed in, in this country and something that we all want to do something about. So once again, I, I just want to thank everybody for the work that you're doing. I look forward to keep getting back to work, all of us, and pursuing uh, uh, the, the work that we all know needs to be done for our planet and for each other. So thanks again, everybody. Great work.